we just held our sixth annual field event. We kicked it off with two different camera schools, one for our pro staff and one for our field staff. Adam and Matt did a great job of sharing tips so everyone can get some higher quality video this fall. That afternoon, after the camera schools, we offered some mini consulting opportunities. And we had several dozen of our guests bring maps, soil tests, pictures, and everything about their property so we could sit down on tables and go through it and help them develop a site-specific habitat hunting strategy for their property. <laughs> In addition to assisting several landowners, several of the Going Deer partners are here to explain their products and the best way to use them to get the most out of their habitat and hunting plans. Morel Targets even had a great bow range set up so folks could practice and make sure their bows were tuned in for the upcoming season. No doubt everyone here was a die-hard hunter and they were all excited about the upcoming 2016 season. Growing Deer is brought to you by Bass Pro Shops. Also by Rick Onyx, Trophy Rock, Eagle Seed, Nikon, Winchester, Dead Down Wind, Antler Dirt, Lacrosse Footwear, Blood Sport Arrows, Wetwood Natives, Morel Targets, Non-Typical Wildlife Solutions, Hooks, Custom Calls, Montana Decoy, Summit Tree Stands, Drake Non-Typical Clothing, House Lubricator, Genesis No-Till Drill, LEM Game Processing, Fourth Arrow, G5 Broadheads, Prime Bows, and redneck hunting blinds. The next morning started early as we gathered at 7 a.m. and the first stop was with professional trapper Clint Carey. We met, gosh, I don't know, a long time ago. I've known you a little while. <laughs> and, and I fancy myself as a trapper until I met Clint and I realized I'm still an apprentice, so I'm still learning. So Clint's given us some great demonstrations in the past on different sets, flat sets and dirt hose and all this stuff. So I'll, and you can see all that online. So I've asked him this year to go on a little bit to the graduate level and talk about how he particularly gets critters to that set. There's so many coyotes that run right by your sets, okay? And you hear it preached all the time. Location, location, location. You can be dead on location and miss 50 to 60 percent of the coyotes that come by. This is my trap right here. So what we're wanting to do is increase excitement. So we're going to take this product right here we got and we scatter this all out in the road, okay? Once we started doing this and putting cameras on it, we had coyotes stopping dead in their tracks out here now as they pass by. So that's the first thing we do is I've got him stopping out here in the road. You at least got a chance at him now. Yes, you want to pay attention to the wind, but the wind's going to change. It's always going to change and have some variability to it. So you want to stop him somehow out there in the road. I started off using lure out there in the road, and that'll work. So you, you just want to do something, though, to get that coyote's attention as he's cruising by. The way I use this loud lure is I take it, and I would smear it out here. Don't step in that. <laughs> lure don't smell natural, really. They're attracted to it, but it's not something natural. It's got a loud odor, and it's something they've really never smelled before. So lure has its place, but to me, those loud lures don't go at your trap. Not loud like that. The lure is to get the animal here. All right? Animal gets close enough if she was off location, then she's got all this out here to create a lot of excitement. She starts feeling more comfortable. All right? Then you've got your bait and your set over here, and you can end it right there. Clint explained how he uses lures to get a coyote's attention at great distance and bring them on in, but uses baits right near the trap to seal the deal. Next, we headed down the road a ways to one of our ridgetop food pots. Why would you ever pay to put nitrogen on a food pot? Ever. It's super common. All you gotta do is plant a plant that takes that from the air with the right bacteria, converts it, and puts it in the soil, and your next crop, if you're doing it the way we propose, will be a non-legume, legumes fix nitrogen, like a grain, like a brassica, or a grain, a weed, or a turnip, or something, and it will suck up this nitrogen that these plants made for free. You didn't drive over your field, compacting soil, put nitrogen down, you didn't do any of those things. It's all there, literally, I mean literally there. And I know, 
This is so anti what we've all been taught for decades. But there's farmers doing this now extremely successfully and financially successfully. So by plants constantly growing throughout the growing season, you know, when it's 20 below or five below or five above, plants aren't growing, right? But when it's possible to grow, they're pulling nutrients up. These decay, release nutrients, and that's the next crop takes them up, and that's where we get our recycling. So this field, as beautiful as it looks, we're going on, our, will be our fourth year that we've not added any nutrients to this field. No lime, no fertilizer, nothing. Not antler, nothing. And we're doing that through refining our rotation of what plants we do. So some plants are really good at taking up some nutrients. This is obviously making a lot of nitrogen. Some plants pick nitrogen out of soil and store it. Some pick phosphorus and figuring out those, we call, generically call them cover crops or farmers do, I call it deer brows. And what I've been really working on, and Adam and Matt and Daniel, is finding crops that are good at that, that deer like to eat also. Not just, there's hundreds of species that could be used for cover crops or plants, but finding ones that fit our need, that deer want to eat, that are preferred deer brows, is really the secret to where Eagle and I are going, working together and putting together blends that are more than just, boy, that's green, and deer walks out and we can shoot it, but actually improving the soil and saving money, and, and quite candidly, you might pay a couple bucks more a bag for this type of seed, because these are not you know, the standard run the mill seed, but you're saving tons of money by not having to put all the fertilizer down. And you're getting, improving the soil. All those things that make it the browse plant. I mean, this was designed for what we're doing, not just a soybean plant. But I encourage you to grab a bean there, or here, or whatever, pass them around, I saw a couple being passed around, and look at all the nodules on here. I mean, it's just an incredible amount of nitrogen putting down that our broadside, we're gonna drill broadside next week if we get any more rain. We, we will drill next week, right through this. And, 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 and so our nitrogen's already there. And these soybeans break down pretty quickly, but look at this cover. Weeds aren't going through that. I mean, there may be one here, there, a little, you know, maybe where we walk today, we're exposed a little soil or something will happen. And you, but in a food plot, the occasional weed just isn't an issue, right? And if it's a nasty weed, a pig weed or something, we don't want seed base to get started. And you got 12 through the field, you just walk out there one day and nip them off or hit them with a little roundup, whatever, and move on. So the other thing we're doing here, and I'll go into this more detail, but we are converting not to a herbicide-free environment. I'm not anti-herbicide at all. But like most people, I'd like to use the least amount I need to. Well, in this situation, weeds aren't coming in here. I'm going to be able to drill my cover crop through here. And if I have a great cover crop, you know, if the deer don't browse down too much, my broadside does great this winter, next spring, about turkey season or so, we're we'll smash it down again, drill our soybeans right in here, and I haven't had to have a herbicide. Just got through with about six weeks of sitting on a bucket in our field every day, cross-pollinating these plants, trying to uh, get the traits we want for either the row crop farmer for higher yield, disease resistance, uh, and, and in this case, we want more forage yield, larger leaves for uh, producing more groceries per acre in the field for the deer. These are very late maturing soybeans, um, and that gives us an advantage in a food plot setting that it does provide, you know, four weeks longer, some cases six weeks longer, available leaf for them to eat while they're making pods. You can see the purple flowers all along here. These are all going to be the pods. And so he's right on schedule for, uh, for, for seed production. The inoculant, we recommend, especially new food plots who've never been, yes, definitely. What Midwest farmers, all you know, U.S. farmers, they don't have to inoculate because they've got the inoculant built in their soil as long as they have soybeans in a rotation every two years. Uh, we do it as a fail-safe every year. Uh, there's different types, but it has to be a soybean inoculant, not a clover inoculant or a pea inoculant. So it is specific. It's just insurance for a nitrogen. That's why we put it on. We inoculate every year here. Yeah. yeah I mean, it's inoculant. Inoculant is the cheapest thing we do. In this pot, we demonstrated use of a roller crimper. They're designed to terminate a crop without using herbicides. Who doesn't want to use fewer herbicides? And in addition, by creating that thick mulch layer, that protects the soil moisture that's in the ground from evaporating eliminates most of the weeds from coming up and 
creates an incredible erosion barrier. As rain falls on that vegetation, slows it down, and it slowly seeps in to the ground. So the crimper, not just a roller, a crimper. You see how, I mean, I just totally broke that plant, right? This top part is dead. Adam, it's Adam back there. Bring it on. We simply will drill right through here. We use several techniques to plant food plots, depending on size, location, what we're planting. In this field, we demonstrated how we used the new Genesis no-till drill. But see how the drill conforms to the lay of the land, because each one has individual springs. It's not a solid bar or solid roller type thing across the back. Those, and so you want each wheel to adjust to the perfect height where you are. So I, I'm just going to tell you, I am thrilled that we can take something this rough, this slopey, this high stand of forage and put a successful crop in. And we did it in two passes, just that quick. After talking in great detail about these food plot techniques, we rolled down the mountain where Adam spent some time showing how we use mock scrapes. I think last year we put up 15 different mock scrapes. We love to monitor them with our Reconix cameras. But we're using this one as a hunting tool. So we've got this big food plot, and we're trying to bring deer out in the middle. They may be eating right on the edge, but now we want every buck that comes in this field to come to the middle. We're going to do that by adding a mock scrape. So I've cut a sycamore. First thing I do is I kind of like to trim out the, the bottom limbs. Basic T-post. You get it for like under 10 bucks at a hardware store. You do want to make them solid. We thought we could get away early on just driving them in a few inches. We actually have video of a young three and a half year old. He is going to town on this mock scrape. We have a video of him just thrashing his antlers. Next picture, it's all over the place, all over the ground. So they can get violent with them. We're using just basic wire. You always want to anchor it in two places. Even if there's not, not that many deer out here, this is a communication post. He may come out here to check and see if any other deer have came and worked the scrape that morning or that afternoon. Of course, in the fall, I'm wearing my lacrosse simp rubber boots. I want it to look like a deer has already worked it. And just like that, we have a, communica a communication post mock scrape right in the middle of the food plot for any buck that comes in here during the fall to come check out. One thing we are trying out this year I'll start off, it's synthetics. It's all synthetic tinks, lures. These are the, uh, the scrape bombs and the scrape starters. We're gonna try them out, see if we can just pique the curiosity of the deer. Of course, they're a curious animals, so any extra scent out here that may cause a deer that's just downwind to walk in here and, and offer a shot is uh, something we definitely wanna do, so we're gonna try this out. Any guys have questions, comments about mock scrapes? I usually put them out early October, mid-October. One thing that I mentioned early on is using oak trees. That's very important for us. I cut the sycamore because basically finding a good oak tree around here for that is, can be difficult sometimes, so I'm not gonna waste one putting it out in August. So. We turned out a valley and went partway up a mountain to where I had a great encounter with a three-year-old buck a couple years ago. That buck responded to a grunt call, so it was a neat setup to share exactly how and when I use grunts to bring in mature bucks. And Adam and I were set up and everything was right and we look up, I think Adam saw him first. And uh, I don't know, 100 yards up here or so, we saw Gumby, which is, was a great three-year-old that year, cutting across and I grabbed a grunt and just barely. Now I think about rattling, all the commotion, movement, shiny stuff going on or which one you'd rather do as a hunter. Yeah, no doubt. And Gumby went up, he looked at us, and then disappeared. But Adam and I were both very confident, and he come out right here and stood about where that buck is actually a little closer, about six yards from the stand. Really tempting as a three-year-old. I didn't want to shoot him. Now, Adam said, shoot him, shoot him, shoot him, but I, I wasn't going to shoot him. I much prefer, like 90 to 1, grunting over rattling. What attracts bucks, your best odds are, I mean, just Write this one down. You see all these calls or shows talking about, man, you got the big bruiser call, sounds like a 14 and a half year old buck, the stud of the woods, you know, whatever. Well, that scares 90% of your bucks away. 
We've learned from experience it's best to replicate the sounds of a two and a half year old buck tending a doe. That's exactly why we designed the messenger grunt call, to sound like an immature buck tending a receptive doe. In that situation, other immature bucks, and especially mature bucks, will want to charge in and take that receptive doe from a buck that's not capable of defending her. And here's one last thing I want to say about this tool. I mean, it's an awesome tool. I'm, gonna I'm not just going to see deer and grunt. I'm thinking, where's he going? Where's my wind stream? I need to time this grunt just right. There's a big difference in when you grunt. And our setups want to be typically what Adam referred to earlier as threading a needle. If the wind is perfectly hitting you dead perfect right on the nose, what does that tell you? It's dead against the favor of a mature buck. If it's perfectly in your favor, it's 180 degrees the wrong way of where deer wants to be. Our best hunts, when we can get the wind at about a 45 degree angle, we're right on the edge of getting busted. And the deer is right on the edge of being safe. And don't take that lightly. There's a, he, Adam and I and Matt and Daniel, we work really hard to pick stands on a day-to-day -day basis where we're right on the edge of getting busted. Because if we're fail proof. Man, there's no way a deer's going to bust us. A mature deer is probably not going to be there in bow range. We stopped again just up the ridge where on one side of the road we used traditional timber stand improvement techniques and the other side of the road we used hack and squirt. And I sent about a 30 yard head fire up through here to try to kill all these sassafras. These are sassafras saplings. This is obviously dead. It's been burned multiple times, fairly hot. And look at all the stump sprouts coming back. So we did all this dangerous work, chainsaws, felling trees this size and that size. Tracy doesn't like walking over all the logs, uh, shed hunting. It's tough dragging deer out of here, blah, blah, blah. This is story A. We're going to go to story B, stay where you are. And we walk through with a hatchet, hopefully a sharp hatchet. I like a little bit heavier hatchet. Hit a tree this size one time, take my squirt bottle, put one squirt in, walk away and that tree's dead. Much safer than a chainsaw, much less expensive than a chainsaw. The little limbs will dry out and fall off in a year or two. Half inch, three quarter inch or bigger, will take three or four years to dry off and fall off, or an ice storm or a snowstorm or something. What are you spraying? On sassafras, we use glyphosate. On maples or tougher to kill trees, you go to Tordon or other herbicides. A Mazapir, spelled I'm a Zapper, generic brands, Chopper Gen 2, that kind of stuff, is wicked on almost all species of hardwoods but it is root and ground active. So if Matt's filling a bottle over here and he spilled some amazapir on the ground, he'd probably kill all these trees that had a root underneath him. So in this case, I'd much rather for pollution and cost and safety use herbicide than mechanical means. All this learning had the crowd really hungry, so we turned around, rolled down the mountain and back to the house for lunch. We had a great barbecue provided by Eagle Seeds. Everyone had plenty to eat, but we didn't waste any time because there's still a lot to share. We headed back down the mountain and up another one to one of the ponds where James Hennis recently convinced me he could take a rocky soil and make it hold water. But don't let nobody kid you. If you're building a pond, a new pond or a lake, regardless again of the size, always insist on proper construction techniques. That's very important, very vital in achieving success with any project you're working on. James shared that almost all ponds eventually leak 
and that by applying the appropriate sealants in there during construction can be a really inexpensive way to ensure that pond lasts for many decades. I'm just curious how many people have a leaky pond? I like to see this. Wow. <laughs> I would estimate, Grant, that probably 50 out of 100 ponds that are built at some point in time in the very near future fail for one reason or another. I don't feel so bad now. <laughs> <laughs> Good rule of thumb, when I'm building a pond or a lake for someone, if I can reach down, grab the soil, wad it up, hold it about shoulder high, drop it, it doesn't shatter, pretty good soil. Provided you can pack it right, probably gonna have a good success rate making that project hold water. And it's also self-healing. A lot of people ask, well, what if a deer steps in it? What if a cow or a horse steps in it? No problem whatsoever, it will heal itself right back up. It's 100% safe, non-toxic, NSF approved. You can eat, drink anything we put in this pond or any pond. Period. For established ponds that are leaking, James often identifies the soil type and the difference in substrates and uses a combination of sealants specific to that location to seal the pond and he guarantees his work. Our next stop was at a location we call Boom Pond Power Line. This happens to be where I harvested hit list buck butter bean last fall. One of our favorite rifle hunting spots and I want to explain why it's such a good spot. We knew receptive does would be in one of these bedding areas and bucks would be crossing back and forth. I call it beagling or bird dogging, trying to bust up a receptive doe in there, or find a receptive doe. And just got set up and actually doing the interview, you know, talking about why we're hunting here, whatever. And I looked down and right out of this side stood one of, one of our hit lister bucks. And uh, man, he just come out awesome. I mean, just big as life right there. And and Matt was still focused tight on me and had to change the focus and all those things. So Buck starts working his way kind of diagonal away from us, just about the power poles down there. And I was patient and it was, you know, a great hunt. That deer, we had pictures, we knew it was in the air. We had pictures at a place up here, 250 yards or so, and some other pictures here. We knew it was in the area. We hadn't hunted this for because we needed that strong south wind and that area is basically like a sanctuary. And, and if we'd have hunted this on a north wind or, or no wind, not a strong wind where since just wanted to drift down the hill, we'd have contaminated basically that area and that hunt probably wouldn't have worked. And we're that picky about hunting. A lot of days we will not hunt. We're not lazy. We just know that we're gonna do more damage than good. We may go sit on a far mountain and glass and scout our hunt stand we don't have much faith in, but we're gonna save our best stands when the conditions are absolutely in our favor. Because this hunt started in August when we cleared all the saplings and trees so there'd be no bullet deflection. And, and that's what it takes. I mean, if you make a living in this rough a country, harvesting deer, or sharing education, teaching people our techniques, we just don't show up one morning and go kill a deer. There's a lot of work that goes into that. We shared our strategy behind the butter bean hunt and how we had stands located in proximity to bedding areas, a food source, and overlooking a known travel corridor. The last stop of the day is always one of the most popular and rode up to the world headquarters of Bass Pro. We had a great meal and while folks were eating, we took one of the properties we'd done a mini consult on during the day, put it up on the big screen, and walked through how we would use techniques to improve the cover, water, and food resources on that property. Each year our pro staff shares some amazing hunts and just as importantly, the techniques they've used to be successful. So we took a little time to honor our pro staff in different categories. This year's hunt was really a neat hunt. We didn't think so, solely. Our viewers thought so. This hunt occurred in the great state of Kansas with Keith and Lindsey Martin. Thank you. Keith recognizes the mature buck. It's a big bodied eight pointer they've seen during years past. It certainly appears he's looking for the source of those grunts. Mac, Mac. Oh, my
your team must extend Ethan Lindsay with a thousand dollar check for their efforts. And it's not, it was a very mature big buck. But I gotta tell you, that's not what we know from your comments turning on. It was the creativity and the professionalism of the videography in the field and taking time to explain to us and why he used the grunt call and when he used the grunt call and how they picked the stand and why they were there. Because anyone can go kill a deer on any given day, kill a good deer. But they took time to do what we're all about, is teaching others to enjoy fish. Thank you, Ethan. Over. We have solved the riddle at 3 o'clock in the morning on... And, they, and, and have families and children and busy church lives and take time to film great heroes. You can achieve your dreams. You can do whatever you want if you really want to do that. Thank you for leaving, guys. Thanks for being here. Congratulations. Each of the teams worked really hard, and I can't wait to see the hunts you produce this fall. Here's a neat opportunity for us to cross paths and talk hunting. Matt's going to be in Baltimore, Adam's going to be in Nashville, and I'm going to be in Memphis at Bass Pro Stores. It's all part of their great fall hunting classic. Come share some hunting stories with us, and let us help you with some hunting strategies and techniques. It's a lot of fun visiting with other hunters and having conversations about the upcoming deer season. But the most important conversation you're going to have this week is when you slow down, be quiet, and listen to what the Creator is saying to you. Thanks for watching Growing Deer. <laughs>